Hi, I'm DJ Ware. On this episode of the Cyber Gizmo, I want to finish the uh, part two of uh, why is your PC so expensive? So I think this has to be in kind of with a story that once upon a time, the personal computer was affordable. And even in high-end builds followed predictable curves. Moore's Law promised more performance for less, and for a while it delivered. But today, even mid-range systems feel out of reach. This could be part of the reason why your PC is expensive, but it's layered. This isn't just a simple answer. So I think it begins in the past, and it stretches into the future, and it's shaped as you have guessed, by AI fever. Before we go any further, it's worth briefly grounding ourselves in where part one left off. In part one, we looked at how artificial intelligence arrived at its current moment and not as a single invention, but as the convergence of algorithms, hardware acceleration, and scale. AI did not suddenly appear. It grew out of decades of work in statistics, machine learning, and high-performance computing. We also looked at what changed. Model sizes grew dramatically. Training runs stretched from hours to weeks. Competition intensified. And time became the dominant constraint. Faster training meant faster iteration, faster deployment, and faster market advantage. The industry responded by concentrating compute. Larger GPUs denser racks, bigger data centers, and increasingly multiple companies building nearly identical facilities, each optimized to compress time by throwing more hardware at the problem. That approach works, but it comes with costs. Power consumption rises sharply. Land use increases. Infrastructure becomes harder to build and harder to duplicate. And the computing landscape shifts upward away from individual users and towards centralized control. Part one ended with an open question. If AI is being built at planetary scale, where does that leave the personal computer? In 1848, a man found gold at Sutter's Mill, California. That event triggered a human stampede to California from 1848 all the way up to about 1860, when the gold finally panned out. But that rush attracted over 300,000 miners from all over the globe. Was there people that got rich doing mining in California? Oh, I'm sure there were. But it was probably the companies, the mining companies that got rich, not the individual miner. It wasn't necessarily that they knew they were going to become rich. They just wanted to try. And people poured in from every direction. In 2005, another kind of, go of gold rush was spotted, this time from a book. This is Ray Kurzweil's The Singularity is Near. It didn't ignite the AI revolution alone, but it did mark a clear beginning. Just as the California gold rush pulled in miners and prospectors and fortune hunters, Kurzweil's vision ignited engineers and futurists and VCs and eventually corporations. The AI fever had started with a spark, but it didn't ignite until several years later when Russian President Vladimir Putin declared, whoever becomes the leader in this sphere will become the ruler of the world. That statement echoed like a cannon shot in a global boardroom. AI was just no longer a future. It was a battlefield and the companies mobilized. Why is your PC so expensive? The first cost is Moore's Law. It's the death of the flatline progress that Moore's Law uh, had provided up until we reached somewhere around 7 nanometer. That cost to develop that chip went from here to about there. <laughs> Each successive uh, shrinkage from 5 nanometer to 3 to 2 has a corresponding logarithmic scale by which that cost goes exponentially goes up. Today's soaring PC prices, I think, are, are three. There's three reasons. First is the advanced fabrication nodes. 
2 nanometers to 5 nanometers require extreme ultraviolet lithography, EUV. Also, clean room conditions beyond comprehension. And a global coordination. Moore's Law now costs more at every single step we make down the chain. So the rising demand for RAM, storage, and GPUs, especially by AI companies, has created a resource war. Memory is scarce. There's GDDR6, HBM, and DDR5. Those are all being sucked up by AI companies. And the consumer products? They're left with scraps. They get whatever's left on the fabrication lines. Third is we have land, water, and energy. All are necessary for chip production. And those have grown more expensive and constrained and politically sensitive. Let's take, for example, Taiwan, Texas, Oregon, South Korea, Arizona. They, they compete not just on price, but on physical possibilities. There are only so many places you can build those facilities and have the resources you need. Those are just tangible drivers. We now have the AI fever that brings something else. The first is demand. The AI data center doesn't buy one or two GPUs. They buy tens of thousands of them. And every chip has to be top bin. They're, you know, they're, they're harvesting off the top silicon. They want the very best, the most reliable, the fastest, the lowest latency, and the highest bandwidth. And they never stop. There are companies like OpenAI, Meta, Microsoft, Amazon, Apple, Anthropic, and thousands of other small startup companies, and also Google. They're not building data centers. They're building compute cities. Let me give you an example. Facebook's Meta Llama 3 rollout alone involves tens of thousands of H100 class chips. Each one of those pulls energy, consumes rare earth materials, and displaces consumer allocation. I can give you an example personally. In April 2025, I bought 32 gig of DDR5. I think it was 6,000 megatransfers per second. RAM, it's not top tier memory, right? I bought it for about $135. By December, that same kit is 420 bucks. I then went and I, in June, I bought a four terabyte Lexar NM790 SSD. I purchased it in June for 250 bucks. I can't find it. It's not even, it's nowhere to be found now. It's like gone. It, they all say not available, not available. Check, we don't know when we'll be restocked. There's a comparable Western Digital SSD that's available and the cost of that one, which back in June, as I recall, was only about $10 different from the Lexar. That is now going for 400 bucks. But AI is clearly winning the silicon lottery. Enterprise-grade NVMEs are faster, more durable, and they're prioritized. The home user sits and waits behind the, the fabrication lines because those lines have been reserved years in advance, and if they don't have the line, they can slip some money and pay to jump in line. Makes me wonder if, would we ever do it? We're doing it. And it's really hard. It's like shipping silicon that works is really hard. It's really expensive. And the AI software stack, it looks so easy. Look at a PyTorch program. 600 lines of code, couple matrix multiplies. What could be hard about it? 500 people, four years later, holy cats, this is hard. Uh, but we're getting really good at it. But I can tell you this. There is a company that's taking a different route, and that's TensTorrent. TensTorrent is a company that's led by Jim Keller. He's pretty well known as the designer for AMD's chips as well as others. But we're also providing the tools to do that. I think that's really important. So we're building a full stack, right? And we talked to lots of people. My investors call me up because I <clears throat> spend too much money. And they're like, can you focus on something? Well, AI is wild. It goes from really little to really big. Image, inference, or language, stable diffusion, which has got everything, right? 
training, infra it's, it's so diverse and it's still changing. I, I don't want to be the guy that did a, a targeted LLM chip taped out like one month after a new model came out to blow LLMs out of the water. That's going to happen, by the way. So if you're doing an LLM only chip, uh, I don't, personally don't think that's going to work. There's a lot of innovation going on. So there's a generality to the platform that's really important, right? And a breadth to it. And I want to make AI and RISC-V successful, lower cost, more available. And so we decided to invest CPU, AI, software systems, training. We support and license everything we do. Our strategy is open source software, open source support IP. We do high-end CPUs and AI that we license. We sell chips and servers. Next year, we're going to start to sell chiplets. It's going to be great. I really want to make the next generation of computing much more open. I want to build things faster. I want to make it more fun. And the AI tools are really cool. Just think about having an IP that works, that's composable, a chiplet framework, and support IP that already works so you can do your job. Right, and put it together and verify it faster and build it faster. Like, we're really doing this. He's chosen to avoid the whole contested fabs entirely. At least that's what he said in his, his uh, keynote from October. For now, their Ascalon CPU, which they also announced back in October, is a RISC-V processor that's being built without delays, which seems to suggest they're using mature fabrication nodes. What do I mean by mature? I mean ones that are in less demand. So the seven nanometer, the 10 nanometer, who knows? I, they haven't said what it is. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna guess, but I'm gonna, uh, but it's logical to assume it probably isn't three or two nanometer. The other area to talk about is backlash. Not everyone is celebrating AI fever. Inside the companies that are building these models, a backlash is rising. There are engineers that are quitting. They're leaving their jobs because they're concerned about bias and control and ethical uh, reasons, also blindness, and also the use of data and where that data comes from. Outside, the public is also growing wary they are they're concerned about livelihood, resources, how it's going to affect their daily lives and pricing. There's, as, this, as this pressure builds, I can tell you one thing that will definitely follow, it always has, and that's regulation. And regulation usually overshoots or undershoots the problem. They usually arrive too late. The damage is usually done ahead of time, and it's impossible to get rid of. There's also another model. Back in the 1980s, there was uh, Japan, which had built a next-generation supercomputer that overshadowed anything that was built in the U.S. And it sent the DOD into a tizzy. They did, I mean, they rely on, D, on supercomputers for a lot of things. And so they were worried. I mean, being displaced at the top by uh, a Japanese supercomputer was admitting that, hey, you're no longer a player in technology. And they wrote a report. They set it up the chain of command, it got to the president's desk. He's commander in chief, after all. He looked at it, he read it, he took it seriously, he took it to his staff, and he said, solve it. And they went out to academics and to the industry and to the think tanks and to the industry experts, and they said, okay, what do we do? And they formulated a plan called the Strategic Computing Initiative. Now, that initiative lasted till about mid-1990 or so. SCI was kind of given a rebirth. It's different. It's not the same by President Obama. It's managed mostly by the NSF. The National Science Foundation is, they generally fund foundational research, you know, basic research that doesn't necessarily translate into a product, but it's necessary for the public interest. 
I remember NS, NSF being involved in Plato, which was the system I worked on. We presented them with a set of goals, and here was the goals we wanted to accomplish with Plato. I didn't, but Mitzer did. They looked at it and said, okay, we'll fund you at this level, because that's what they requested, for X number of years. And when, you, when, and when you're going against goals, there isn't an expectation that you're going to have something done on a certain date that has these features in it. No. It's, what's your progress? What steps have you identified? What steps have you completed? Where are you having trouble? That's the kind of questions the NSF worked. And you know what it did was it, it blew open a huge amount of creativity that I have never seen since. It's amazing what happens when you turn a bunch of bright people loose with a very powerful computer. So yeah, I mean, that's the point about basic research. It defines solutions for problems that aren't here yet. Is AI foundational? And if it is, what percentage of that research could be done with all of you working together in a single set of AI data centers, whether it's three or five or 10, I don't know what the answer is. That's got to be defi defined. I don't know what you think, but that's what I think. <laughs> and if you have a different opinion, hey, the comments are open. Uh, I would love to hear yours as well. Let's answer the question definitively. Why is your PC so expensive? Because you're computing with a new kind of miner, not the one at Sutter's Mill, but the one in a server farm that's chasing tokens and training graphs. They're chasing the only form of progress they can show is how large a model they can make. Each model requires more infrastructure, more memory, more GPUs. Let me back up for a second and give you a sci-fi reference. Do you remember like uh, watching the Terminator that was a statement where, where uh, Skynet a uh, amassed so much knowledge, it just, bing, turned into sentient. That, fra that framing of intelligence from AI is so common in sci-fi literature. You can, you can go back to Colossus. You can go back to Hal. It was all this, always the same. You put in X amount of information and knowledge, and then, ding, sentience appears. Is that true? So, Val, I'm going to let you close this one out. And... Uh, an old gold mine in South Dakota is no longer used for mining, but it is a historic place which is open to tours. At the end of the tour, each child is given a small gold rock. The rock came with a card read, All that glitters is not gold. The rock, as it turns out, is iron pyrite, better known as fool's gold.